Hello, everyone, and welcome to INSEAD's Lifelong Learning Webinar Series. Uh, this webinar is part of INSEAD's Tech Talks, organized by Digital at INSEAD, where we are supporting the digital transformation of business and society globally. Check out our website where you can find knowledge, research, cases, or programs related to this topic. Thanks to the INSEAD team for making this webinar and all the other webinars possible. Today, I have the pleasure to discuss with our panelists how corporates can solve critical problems faster through top startup solutions during a crisis like COVID-19, but also hopefully beyond. We have people from over 70 countries signed up. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you around the world. Thanks for joining. My name is Jörg Niesing, and I'm a professor of marketing at INSEAD and my research and teaching is focusing on the intersection, digital transformation, customer-centric strategies, and data analytics. I'm also the program director of INSEAD's executive education programs leading digital marketing strategy and B2B marketing strategies. And as luck will have it, I'm publishing my book, The Definitive Guide to Digital Transformation, um, this week. Um, so feel free to uh, reserve your copy uh, if you want on our website shown here on the slide. So with this, um, let me get started to introduce um, our speakers today. Uh, Gregor co-founded 27 Pilots almost two years ago to help companies gain competitive advantage through startup solutions. At 27 Pilots, Gregor is responsible for strategy and growth and prior to 27 Pilots, he worked six years at BMW uh, where you also uh, founded the BMW Startup Garage and uh, implemented an approach how BMW could better. Christian co-founded Scoutbee after years of experience in business analytics, management systems, supply chain management, as well as consulting. Scoutbee recently uh, raised 80 million in funding and was awarded a highly recommended procurement technology 2019. Christian earned his PhD in business informatics with a thesis on integrated planning and decision making. Finally, Mario, after his studies of business and economics at the University of Münster, he started his career in strategy consulting. And in 2002, he moved on to Deutsche different positions within corporate strategy as well as in operational management of Telekom Germany. Mario co founded a startup in the smart home environment. And since 2014, Mario is the Chief Digital Officer at Bosch Siemens Home Appliances. And since 2018, he's also the head of the Digital Business Unit. So thank you all uh, for joining um, this uh, webinar. Let's uh, dive uh, right into uh, the content. The recent explosion of new technology and digital disruption across all industries is driving the need for quicker and more flexible solutions. And this, of course, is now even more pressing during a pandemic like COVID-19. That's why today's webinar is focusing on the topic of how startups could help corporates with their turnarounds and how startups and corporates could collaborate in a better way. We wanna structure this webinar in three blocks. The first block is really about why are startups critical for recovery from COVID-19? The second block is how could corporates and startups uh, better collaborate during a crisis. And then the last block is really about what can we learn from this for the future. So also uh, address your questions, please, um, related uh, to these blocks. So before we dive into block number one, just a little bit about the audience today. Thanks for uh, the people that have answered uh, the survey. And as you can see, we have a good mix. Uh, almost 60% are from corporates, while 43% are from startups, which is also, again, showing uh, a little bit um, that um, we uh, have uh, both perspectives, press both perspectives today in the discussion. And also, what you can see here for the corporates, um, roughly 60% are engaging with startups, while 41% uh, currently do not engage. And as you can imagine, um, we could spend the entire webinar on housing, 
But the questions you submitted indicated that you are also in particular interested in how startups could help you with your problems related to COVID-19, whether it's related to supply chains, or workforce planning, remote work or declining demand. But nevertheless, we want to spend a few minutes at the beginning. Um, how could startups briefly um, or how could startups uh, help with the pand pandemic directly? So here question, uh, Gregor, uh, for you. Um, you founded uh, the platform Startup Against Corona and you have looked into many startups uh, that could help um, with COVID-19. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, this initiative and then maybe even before, um, tell us a little bit more what 27 Pilots is all about? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Jörg, and it's an um, honor to be a uh, part of this uh, of this uh, of this panel. Thanks a lot. Yes, uh, Twenty Seven Pilots is a company that I founded with uh, three colleagues out of BMW just about two years ago. And what we're doing for BMW and now also other corporates is um, something pretty, you know, some, something that sounds pretty simple, which is competitive advantage through top uh, startup solutions. And uh, the, the, the model, uh, the, the organizational capabilities that we're implementing or helping corporates uh, to, to implement, um, we summarize this under the name uh, venture, the venture client model, which is a basically new approach to corporate venturing. And the big difference to the traditional way of corporate venturing is that what companies do here is instead of buying a small part of the equity of a startup, they become a client and buy a small amount of the products of the startup. And that helps them experience and get to use the startup solution very quickly, very efficiently with very low risk. And that in turn um, speeds up the decision of a corporate to enter a, or a M&A or other form of uh, investment agreement with the startup company. Startup against Corona was an was a idea that came um, that that we had in the, at the right at the beginning of, of the lockdown, um, beginning of, of March, mid March, and what motivated us to do that was that we that we saw that companies are facing you know a a, a critical business challenges that are the result of the pandemic, you know, the lockdown. Um, so it's not only, you know, keeping employees healthy, it's also, you know, keeping supply chains healthy. It's about uh, distancing and on the workplace and so forth. So we saw a whole interesting amount of new challenges arising and we thought, aren't there startups out there that could provide immediate help? So those startups that have received, you know, significant amounts of funding in 2019 aren't, wouldn't those uh, startups be capable of turning around and creating features that target specific uh, COVID cause issues and, and through that be able to help um, at great speed um, to solve uh, new, new business problems. And what we saw is that when we launched this platform in, uh, in, uh, on March 18, we uh, by now have some around 450 startups on the platform that in total uh, raised over 6 billion worth of venture capital funding that they're now putting to use to solve uh, business problems of, um, of corporates all around the globe. And uh, do you see uh, any corporates providing similar solutions or do these uh, most of the great ideas you're seeing, do they come from startups? Well, a well-funded startup uh, that, that received, you know, a lot of funding um, recently, uh, like towards the end of 2019, they are all unique by definition. You know, a venture capitalist wouldn't give um, millions to a startup that has a solution that incumbents also have. And so that's always the, really the, you know, the competitive advantage of a startup is that I have something, you know, that's unique, nobody has that, or what my solution is, uh, is significantly better. So by definition, if I look at a startup that, that raised significant amount of funding, I as a corporate um, have a strong indicator of 
you know, paying attention to that solution because it probably is unique and I should look at it in order not to miss out on an opportunity to, you know, to innovate or to, or to uh, improve my processes or to solve a, a COVID related issue. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing, Gregor. Yeah, there's a question uh, we got before the webinar, uh, maybe last question on, uh, on, on this topic, how startups could help directly. What about startups that are now coming up with great solution for COVID-19 and uh, but what do they do uh, if uh, this uh, pandemic disappears at one point? Um, so what would you advise? Well, unless you are a, uh, unless you are a health startup that's focusing uh, specifically on, on this pandemic and on future pandemic, pandemic, I would see that startup that, that are founded these days, they, they would focus on, on specific uh, efficiency and speed problems that corporates have that that will will still be there after the COVID, correct? So um, we think that COVID causes some uh, so, some issues, and we'll see, for example, probably with the example of of, of Christian, that uh, that are not now more urgent, but that those business problems won't go away when COVID goes away. So focusing on on the problems that COVID to some extent accelerates is probably a good idea if, if, uh, if that startup is, you know, uh, um, is, if, if you're looking to, you know, to, uh, to found a company that, that, that persists beyond COVID. Yeah. yeah, with that, let's maybe move to the bigger topic, how startups could help any corporates with problems caused by COVID-19. Uh, so Christian, um, you are uh, the co-founder of ScoutBee and responsible for the growth of the startup. Uh, could you briefly tell us a little bit about your company and the product itself? Sure. So thanks and hello everybody also from my side uh, calling in from Berlin. So I have uh, maybe the coldest weather here, at least uh, what I see with my co-speakers here. Everybody besides Gregor in Munich has also a pullover. So hello, warm welcome. Hey, a few words uh, and uh, about Scalpy, what are we doing um, in general? We are supporting production-oriented companies, manufacturing com companies like automotive industry, like uh, machine, machine building industry, but also pharmaceuticals, med tech companies, high tech companies, fast moving consumer good companies um, with founding the right suppliers. So that's very broad. I will show you also on the next slide how this looks like in, in, in details, what we are doing there. And maybe if you can go back to the slide before, please. Yes. So we were founded uh, 215. And here you see it already. Um, so it, it's not just for the purpose of Corona, but as also Gregor mentioned before, it's very important. We were talking about digitization, digital transformation in the last five to 10 years, some also even longer. It depends if you include e-commerce and all the, the waves which have been there before. But right now we really see the necessity and the pressure that we have to live it up. Yeah, If we think about the uh, um, home office solutions, new work topics, but it's right now also for B2B oriented companies to really use, uh, in our case, AI based scouting, you know, AI -based procurement, instead of going to trade shows. It's simply not possible to go to trade shows right now, but then you need to find backup suppliers for your second sources because some supply chains are disrupted, but you do not yet know which key element of the supply chain is disrupted. So it's simply necessary. and. Uh, uh, the clients who started with us some years ago, they are ready all right and they, they are prepared already. They can use the tool. Other clients right now are kind of panic and say, okay, can you help us finding backup suppliers, second sources? Please let's start. So that's overall in a nutshell. We are overall very global. We are expanding and we plan to be uh, to start also in Asia beginning of next year. But it sounds like the pandemic impacted the demand for your product in, in a positive way. Uh, overall, yes, even if we do not want to be kind of uh, uh, benefiters or the profiters out of this, uh, but in general, yes, because in the last two years, we had a lot of discussions with uh, chief uh, purchasing officers, but also with CFOs, head of supply chains, regarding how to transform procurement into the digital world and, and uh, supply chain. Right now, in the last two or three months, I'm really mainly talking about how to create a kind of a sustainable and a balanced and a secure 
supply chain uh, and uh, try to really enable this. That's right. But I also have to say, in April, we could not really get in touch with our uh, existing customers because they uh, haven't been able to work. Some, some are really not allowed, uh, especially in the German market, to respond to emails in April because of the total lockdown. But since 1st of May, it's really uh, going a uh, high increase right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Mario, uh, let's move to the corporate world. Um, could you please give us a quick overview of uh, VSH and your, your main products? I assume uh, most of uh, our uh, audience today has at least, uh, at least one of your brands. Uh, I hope so. Uh, as a European market leader and one of the global leaders in the home appliance industry, uh, BSH is producing and selling major domestic appliances uh, like ovens and fridges, and of course, uh, smaller domestic appliances like uh, coffee machines or vacuum cleaners. Under brands, like, like you, you can see here on the chart on the right side, I think the most, uh, the most uh, well-known ones are probably Bosch, Siemens, and our luxury, uh, in the luxury arena, Gaggenau. But we also um, look pretty much into a connected world and uh, have an ecosystem brand, which is called Home Connect, which is basically connecting all our appliances to the house, to the users, and uh, to, to more services or appliances. Well, base BSH, as you can see, is uh, with uh, 13 billion of, of refs and uh, with 60,000 employees worldwide, is part of the Robert Bosch Group. And um, yeah, that's, that's maybe the, the shortest way of introducing BSH. Yeah, and what's your perspective as the head of uh, the digital business unit and the uh, chief uh, digital officer? Uh, would you agree that startups play a relevant role in the recovery and help you with some of the business problems uh, we discussed earlier? Well, actually, we are just recovering. So uh, maybe uh, two, from, two or four months later, I could have answered it completely. But uh, in general, I have to say that startups solve uh, certainly uh, business problems that we had in the past. So we have a good couple of cases where we have seen that they have really uh, edge solutions that help us out. I assume that, that in this recovery phase, as you, uh, as you explained it, I hope that we can even come out stronger with the help of, of startup companies because they can deliver solutions faster. And in some ways we might be more innovative uh, with them on board. So um, yeah, I, I think they can and they will. Yeah, I'm also seeing a question here linked, linked to what you just said. I mean, do you have some examples um, how startups uh, do help you directly, maybe uh, with COVID-related issues, uh, but maybe also in general? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, to frame it a little bit, I think we have two basic problems we are, we are solving with startup solutions. The one you can see here also on the slide is uh, we're looking for for uh, looking to enable new kind of home appliances. So we're looking for product innovations. And there, there is a startup arena where we can, where we can uh, work with. And on the other side, of course, we are looking into process innovations. So uh, to, to uh, raise in the, the productivity and of course the efficiency of our core processes and of our support functions. As examples, as you answered, as you asked for, maybe on the product side, I have a three uh, to give you a, a little bit of flavor what that is. So we, have, we are working with a company called Hypersurfaces. Hypersurfaces is, if you will, a sensor technology company that is able to, to convert an object into a user interface, which is, as you can imagine, as a home appliance manufacturer, pretty interesting, or Pasho. Pasho is, uh, is um, delivering a real-time uh, food detection system uh, with tools for food tracking and also nutrition insights. Very interesting for us uh, in combination, for example, with our fridges. Or Nanofill, which is um, self-cleaning uh, technology uh, on the basis of nanocomposite uh, coatings. So also something that, that will make our products better and even more interesting to consumers. On the products uh, process side on the right, you can uh, maybe uh, start on the, on the far right. We have already have some, some good examples working with Inspecto. Inspecto is a, is a machine vision system, an autonomous machine vision system uh, to, um, let's say, to improve the industrial quality uh, of our products. So it's a quality assurance uh, help. Through your mind, for example, and uh, also that is a, is a great tool, is an online um, 3D uh, 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 support that we can turn our data into let's say 3D masterpieces. 
And uh, Marvinoid, and this is exactly an example that, that crosses the road to the COVID uh, situation. We worked with them earlier, but their use of their tools had been intensified due to, uh, due to the corona situation. And what, what is the basis of their, 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 their business? They have an autonomous, I would call it troubleshooting platform, and uh, which is basically a virtual agent that is giving first uh, first line support for technical products. And uh, you can imagine that when people are sitting more at home, they will cook more at home and because they couldn't go to restaurants. And in these cases, and also due to questions uh, to, to the surfaces in COVID-19 times and how to, uh, to free them up for bacteria and stuff like that, we got a lot of help from these, uh, this solution that we used uh, for Marvinoid. Yeah. So it sounds like also here you're benefiting a little bit from uh, you have set it up earlier and we will talk about how to best yeah, uh, collaborate with startups and how you're really um, benefiting from the solution. Great. Christian, uh, linked uh, to this, I mean, what's, what's your perspective, uh, the entrepreneurial perspective uh, about startups being critical for the recovery? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, the, the big advantage, I think all of us who are participating here know that, is that startups have the uh, big advantage that they can act very fast and that they can respond very fast to, to challenges and to problems. I do not want to say, say that uh, bigger corporates uh, cannot act fast or smart or something like that, but it's simply due to the corporate rules and the processes and budgeting process that you really can iterate better, A-B testing, MVP testing, all those topics. And that's the reason why I think uh, that there is a huge and a massive impact of the startup ecosystem and of startups overall. Nevertheless, we have always the same kind of process or cleaning process, I would call it. There are a few, a lot of ideas and do not want to give a number out of 10 ideas. One becomes successful. That's like an R&D process in, in a corporate world. But the, the difference is that the R&D process for 10 ideas uh, needs, let's say, one year on average. And I do not have scientific figures here. And we can right now in the startup world check this out within two months. No. Yeah, Gregor, what, what's your perspective? I mean, you have uh, worked uh, for BMW, as we have heard earlier, but also IDEO. So you have seen both worlds. Well, I think um, what... what um, Maybe, maybe everybody, if, if you think about big companies that emerged in the last 30 to 40 years that everybody knows, and, um, and, and, and you really think about those huge, large corporations that have changed our lives, you know, think about, you know, Intel, think about uh, Oracle, think about uh, Cisco, you know, most recently think about, you know, uh, or, or back Apple, Google, correct? What, what do all those companies have in common, right? Those companies were all at some point startups, but not just startups, but venture-backed startups. So I think a critical element that we have to, when, when we have to talk about when we talk about the speed of startups, because ultimately speed comes from money, correct? And there's definitely one source of money, which is your printing machine, correct? And that's, you know, the government, correct? Who's kind of like, you know, let's print money, let's throw out money to the market and let's see if we can get a vaccine fast. But the other engine that really drives innovation has been dri driven at innovation in terms of providing the resources for that has been venture capital and it will remain so. And that amount of venture capital really gives a lot of speed and a lot of competitiveness to the startups. And that's not nothing that is, a, a corporate doesn't have access to corporate venture capital. And Mario can call, you know, Sequoia and say, hey, send me 20 million because I had a great idea. That's not possible. And, and I think here's something that we need to focus on as a corporate in terms of saying, hey, how critical, how fast can those startups move and you want to have an argument as a corporate that goes beyond, oh, those guys are faster because that means that you're slow. Maybe focus on, hey, those guys have critical funding that is just too risky for my R&D process or for my improvement process. And they have it right now. They have it there. That doesn't have, that's nothing that I can find in my current supplier and, 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 and really use that also as an indicator to, uh, to determine you know, how critical 
is, is uh, that solution from that startup and how fast can they help me and how scalable is it within, within my corporate so it can generate a benefit uh, faster rather, uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point, the speed and, and flexibility. Let's maybe move to this because I also see a couple of questions here in the Q&A linked uh, to this. Mario, would, would, would you agree? I mean, um, wouldn't you, uh, or some people at uh, VSH, wouldn't they say, hey, why don't we create this internally? Why do we need to uh, build this ecosystem uh, and leverage startup, uh, as Gregor said, more at, at scale? Yeah. It's a very good point um, and an interesting point. I, I figured out that there are maybe two or three things that stand in the way of a more scaled approach. The first one is there are some colleagues that absolutely don't know, honestly don't know that there might be an edge solution that will help themselves to speed up innovation. And, and there you have to bring some kind of push into the organization. So you have to kind of offer the link and, and share the news and, and ask for or support without knowing that they need support uh, to be really offensive in that case. But the second one, and, and I think you pointed out pretty well, is some might, might know but don't want to know that this solution or solution exists. And in these cases, we might risk in some cases uh, higher costs, uh, lower, faster or lower times to market, uh, the risk of failure. But there are also some, maybe also supporting the second group that have some prejudices against startups. You know, they, they will vanish any any time because they don't have the money. They are not that good as we are. I mean, we have 50 years of experience, like these kind of arguments. So I think also something you have to fight for and support in making contact and talking to the guys. So overall, I see that that the, the offer that the startup corporation can bring or the help that can bring is a highly skilled and dedicated development team with, with the edge solution. And that should convince uh, pretty much everybody to, to go in there. Yeah, very interesting. I'm just uh, showing the slide here from the audience. Uh, almost 300 uh, responded here. Um, the reasons why the corporates that we have on the call here are engaging with startups. And uh, again, it's reflecting a little bit um, what you were saying. But then uh, maybe a uh, bigger question uh, for, you, for you, if on the one hand they are critical, um, recent data is showing that many startups are running out of money or getting lower valuations. Um, how can startups then be critical? Are we just talking about a specific group of startups? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, but before I answer that, maybe the audience can have a quick look at that chart and see this, this bar that says 9.3%. It says, uh, you know, startups are capable of solving a critical challenge I cannot solve internally or through external resources. I think maybe that, that percentage would have been much lower time, time back. And I remember when I was at BMW, it took BMW some, you know, some, uh, some effort to actually go out there and say, hey, there are startups that do stuff better than I can do myself with my seven billion dollar, you know, R and D budget, and and to make that claim and to say, hey guys, I need your help as opposed to you need my help, I think that's that's a big leap, and I think that will that will push the demand for startups, and and will also make a big difference because you know even companies like Apple use startups extensively. Uh, to remain uh, to remain competitive, and they're used, they're doing that, you know, because you know they can do that stuff themselves. Because if, if they would, they um, um, uh, they would do that. So now I made this little excursion. So I need to repeat that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, why are we, are we talking about a specific group of startups, right? Because many run out of cash or lower valuations. Yeah. Yes. When when we talk about startups, we have to remember that by by what by 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 some count, there are anywhere between three to 20 million startups out there, correct? There are some incredible numbers that China creates, I don't know, 5,000 startups a day. So the amount of startups is huge, but what we really need to look at is to distinguish, uh, look at this 1% of startups, and those are somewhere around the 30 to 50,000 startups that get venture capital uh, on, a, on a continuous basis that are actually funded. And through that, they have the growth engine that, uh, that, that makes them very competitive and that makes them, you know, a, 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 a very, very attractive. And, and it's really those types of startups that we're focusing on, that, that 1%. Uh, 
Um, and and uh, though, we, though, though we also are, are sure that as corporates are starting to engage more and more with startups, what would happen is that more and more startups also get venture funding, correct? Because as more startups get acquired or get, get their product adopted, they will, they will generate traction and that traction will generate exits and exits will generate more venture capital. So the more demand we get from the corporate side, that, that, that elite group of, of, of startups that have funding uh, will, will, will also grow in size significantly. Yeah. No, and the uh, question here linked uh, maybe to what you just uh, said um, for Christian then, um, during these times when, uh, when corporates are crunching their wallets, I mean, how can startups assess the willingness for companies to pay? I mean, how, how are you dealing with this? <laughs> well, so that's, uh, I mean, we, we are selling uh, yeah, B2B SaaS software with uh, annual licenses. So usually our um, yeah, process, sales process between, let's say, one month and nine months. It depends on the amount of uh, the, the huge impact of the transformation. So it's not directly affected that they, so it's not something which is going like they are going bankrupt and they do not want to pay us. It's more the postponement of the important budgeting meetings internally, which affects us. So we have to postpone, for example, some meetings who were, which were planned for April to September right now. I think that's more the point and bringing it back to Gregor's point, I think um, we have, the luck or kind of uh, that's the result of the success of the past five years that we are such a strong startup uh, right now that uh, yeah it's just a question of time yeah so i talked to a tier a tier one automotive company uh, this week and they just said okay give us three to five more minutes we plan this for the budgeting cycle xyz no problem we will need you and uh, we make some some short immediate payments for the for the for the bottleneck solution which we need to solve it within the next eight weeks but then that's the point so that's the the real traditional old B2B world, and that's fundamentally different compared to the B2C e-commerce um, uh, startups we have seen massively also in the last years. Yeah, yeah let's, uh, with this, let's maybe move to the second block. Uh, how could corporates and startups uh, better collaborate during the crisis? I mean, here, uh, Mario, I mean, being the uh, CDO for almost six years, um, were you always working uh, with startups uh, since you're there? And if so, um, did the approach, how you collaborate with them, did it change over the years? Well, actually, I think that the startups and startup corporations get more attractive as digital capabilities on the one hand and the, let's say, the ability to, uh, to, to react to more accelerated or to accelerated innovation cycles comes up in this what we call VUCA world and this was maybe or is the the inflection point where you see that startup solutions are getting more traction and startup uh, solutions getting more relevance uh, for BSH um, but we as a company we tried out a couple of things so um, we had a, a different way of interacting with startups so I would call it a holistic uh, strategic venturing and M&A approach. So we, for example, engage pretty, uh, very intensively with early stage startups in our arena, uh, just for the purpose of feeding our ecosystem early on, our home connect ecosystem around our appliances. Also, we, we realized pretty soon that or pretty early that we probably couldn't build all the capabilities by ourselves. So we also acquired startups uh, in the past. So Kitchen Stories is a good example where we bought into a recipe platform, which, is, uh, which helps us in the smart cooking arena, for example. We also ventured into when we thought that as a technology, in this case, it was image recognition, is a maybe a little bit far off and we wouldn't take the risk by ourselves of developing it. So we ventured early on with, for example, a Silicon Valley startup. Um, and above all, and this is what, what comes up, the, uh, the venture clienting approach for us uh, turns out as the most suitable and most scalable amongst those ways of, of uh, interacting with startups. I, would, I wouldn't ban, I wouldn't take them all and I think there is a need for them all. But the scalable and suitable was the venture clienting approach because this is on the hypothesis of a, of a strong cooperation between startup and, uh, and corporate. 
and a little bit of a win-win. I mean, we get a, an edge technology early on, maybe cheaper than after in 10 years. And on the second hand, the startup gets a revenue and with revenue, they get a higher, uh, higher evaluation. And with the higher evaluation, they can, they can benefit on improving the product and we get the improved product later on. But, and so that was the reason why we said, this is our main entry gate. And what we founded is a, a team that is called the, B, the BSH Startup Kitchen, which is basically an interface for startups uh, and uh, a team that is processing and supporting uh, startups to work with BSH. And behind that, uh, this approach, behind this startup kitchen approach, of course, we are able to uh, force the corporation or to intensify the corporation by taking a stake, by acquiring. When we see, for example, if something has been a, a strategic, uh, a strategic uh, supplier of us in, in, the, in the future or will be, um, so there, but the entry, the entry idea is always that of a, of a win-win corporation in a, in a venture clienting model that you also show here on the chart uh, yeah. as one of the relevant approaches. Yeah, no, let's, let's dive a little bit into this. I mean, here we ask the audience again, um, the ones that use uh, various approaches left hand side and uh, companies uh, that want to engage in the future with startups. Um, I mean, Gregor, what, what's your perspective here? Um, as you have seen many accelerators, many venture client units, and uh, you also invented the uh, BMW startup garage and the model. I mean, what's your perspective on the effectiveness of these tools? Because I also see lots of questions here related to this. One comment in the chat, 60% um, fail within the first two years uh, of multinationals that are creating their own startup accelerators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think the uh, the uh, what we've seen is that the, the, the holy grail, let's put it that way, the holy grail of you know of benefiting from a cutting edge unique startup technology is to adopt the startup technology, correct? So you know you really need to get the product, the solution into your 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 corporate setting, whether it's an enabling technology or whether it's a new business model, doesn't matter. You need to use the technology of the startup. And, and you need to do this fast and you do, need to do this at low cost and low risk. And, and if you achieve a fast and low cost and low risk adoption of the startup solution, that now enables you to decide much quicker on a long-term adoption, which is M&A or uh, you know, an, an alliance or co-development or what have you. And the best way to really achieve that is to position you as a client. Right, because there is no startup out there that could say, I don't need clients. Clients is the ultimate goal of every startup. And it was, it's not only what brings revenue, it's also what brings pride and motivation because ultimately entrepreneurs start companies to help their clients. Right? And, and one thing we're seeing and, in, and also in regards to that survey result is that many accelerators are changing to the venture client model. So one of the biggest ones and the most uh, traditional ones from Telefonica called Vira, they just, re they, they retained the name Accelerator, but the operational engine in the Accelerator is a venture client engine. They basically, they went away from investing uh, small amounts of money in a startup and, uh, and uh, getting some rights of equ to equity to actually, you know, purchase the product. And uh, so they adopted the venture client model. And I've also seen that from research from other, from other universities that many accelerators are now, you know, switching and saying, hey, uh, the fastest way for us to access uh, technology is, is by, by using the, the, the processes that are described in the venture client model. Yeah, yeah maybe linked to this, uh, again, seeing a couple of questions here, corporate struggle to kill R&D projects. Right, so they somehow stick to it. We have to continue doing it. I mean, now with COVID, uh, does it pressure uh, corporates uh, to to change their uh, thinking about these different approaches? Maybe Mario, question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think the world will not be the same after COVID, and also our uh, approach to the market will be a different one. So I I see at the moment that like pretty much every R and D initiative will be highly uh, highly evaluated and, and looked if it's really forcing or bringing us to an end. So I could imagine, and, I, and this is a good way of introducing maybe startups into, into that to uh, facilitate and to fasten 
um, that process with the help of startups. Um, so yeah, I would completely say that this, this will happen. So to close, to close this point, maybe um, Christian, what, what's your perspective uh, as the entrepreneur again? Uh, why do many struggle as they run out of investments during this crisis? What, what's, what's your advice? And how can you push corporates um, yeah, to, to, to change their thinking, how they uh, should approach with you as a startup? Um, I think, yeah, bringing this back, that, that's, a, that's the ecosystem between investors, so normal venture capital, then the corporate venture capital slash corporates as a client, and then the startups. Um, for sure, a lot of startups will run out of money just simply because they do not make sales these days because there are, there, there are often no offices open. That's, that's just sometimes the cash burn rate, it's too high that, they, that we will see a lot of uh, startups going bankrupt in the next month. What can, how, how can we solve this? So I would really highly recommend uh, to um, uh, CDOs like Mario that they get a, a big say. By the way, I also did a chief digital officer uh, to study two years ago in the last two years. And there I also saw the importance of such positions, chief digital officer. But I also saw uh, sometimes they are not uh, perceived in the right strategic way and for me the chief digital officers are the kind of chief strategy officers or maybe also the ceos of the next age and i only can uh, yeah, highlight and recommend this to to the corporates that they give the right power and the right instruments to such positions and however you will call it yeah, if you do it like telefonica you have uh, uh, the kind of uh, um, accelerator approach, the corporate venturing approach, the corporate entrepreneurship approach, that's to figure out. But I, I always recommend think about how much percentage of your R&D budget you spend for R&D, how much do you cut out and uh, put into this chief digital officer environment budget because that's then also a new wage, uh, age of investment. Yeah? I mean, uh, if you do the tech scouting, if you do the corporate venturing topics, that's also usually not done from a traditional M&A um, uh, uh, finance, corporate finance department. That's this department. This is my, my biggest advice. Give more money to the CDOs and put it out of the R&D budgets. Yeah, no, and maybe uh, this is a great point and maybe link to this question uh, for all of you related to risk. And again, looking at the, the, the questions here, um, the, also one question that get, got lots of tractions is, is linked to this. Startups can act quickly because they are comfortable at taking risks. Corporates are risk averse, as we know. How do you get corporates to collaborate with startup without taking on that added risk? I mean, here also, I uh, see uh, again the question in the chat. Venture client uh, looks very interesting, but when have venture clients failed and why? And the other question I would add, does it even matter? Um, who, who wants to go first? Maybe, maybe Gregor on this one? Well, the nice thing is it doesn't matter. The cost of the experiment in venture client is meaningless. If, if you set up a CVC unit and the cost, the, not, not the cost, but say the capital required to engage with a startup a good startup is above 500,000, correct? So if you want to get it, if you want to be invited even to a round that's highly subscribed, you're looking at 500,000 plus, maybe a couple of million. So if that's a capital required at the venture client setting to, to, to buy an initial, you know, lot of products from a startup, you're looking at, you know, we've seen budgets, anything as low as a thousand to maybe 25,000, sometimes 50,000, rarely over 50,000. So at BMW, our saying was always, you know, if the technology is really unique, we will always find 10, 20, 30,000. And if, if, if it doesn't work, then you don't, you don't, you don't care because you don't, you don't own equity at this point. So you don't have to deal with, you know, getting rid of the equity and, and legal fees for uh, related to that. So, so the risk, uh, the, the cost of running the risk of testing out a startup product via the venture client approach is so minimal that you can scale the amount of startup solutions that you bring into the company and by scaling the amount of solutions you bring in, you bring in more competitive advantage at a much lower risk and cost. And then at the second stage, you're gonna, you can go into the M&A like Mario explained. Sure. Yeah, anything to add here, Mario? I'm showing Absol the- Absol yep. Absolutely, absolutely true. This is the reason why, why we decided to put up the startup kitchen or, or venture clienting approach first and any, any, everything else behind it also visibly behind it. And uh, I think that helps. But there, 
maybe there are some things to add on that to to mitigate risks. Uh, I mean, at the end, it's it's a it's a question of how do you execute such a venture clienting approach. I think there are a couple of ingredients. I think. For us, the first one was uh, to have an expert team uh, to, to start and to support the process. The second is you have to have clear, clear cut criteria. So you, you don't can be on this side today and on that side tomorrow, and depending on who, to who you speak. The, the third one is to be planable, you have to have a structured approach, structured approach to, to collaborate with a startup. You have to have an early involvement of the internal venture clients. So there will be a BSH department, as an example, who will look for these kind of solutions. So for example, customer service for the Marvinite uh, troubleshooting agent. So uh, there, you have to have an early involvement so that you have an adoption of the solution uh, later on. So that doesn't felt like it, it fall from the sky. And what for me was very helpful uh, at the beginning is uh, also the trust and the recommendations out of the network, actually. So we have a, uh, had a lot, of, uh, a lot of, of people who were promoting things that helped me to start with. So if somebody I really uh, appreciate and has some successful cases brings up such a topic, it's easier to jump on it and also to bring that into the organization. So I think these two ingredients help us. And here you see a little bit what our process is. I don't want to go into detail, but there are some basic services that you as a team have to deliver to the organization. And this is at the bottom of the chart. So without these, this bridge building project management support, talking to the startup, talking to the client, bringing in the different perspectives, especially at the start when, when you don't have, you haven't worked with the startup before. Then the evaluation expertise. I mean, there are tons of startups out there, how to find the right ones and how to evaluate, compare two, uh, two that are basically uh, good ones that could fit to the solution. So this is the second one. And the third one is you have to have a, a standardized process. Otherwise you get lost on the road of one to 180 days to, uh, to onboard the solution. So this is, with the standardized process, with a product demos, with pilots, and only scaling with successful pilots, I think you you can get it done. So, some process, uh, some some requirements to mitigate risk also in this approach, to my mind. Yeah, and maybe just very quickly here, Mario or Gregor at BMW before. I mean, you are all talking about scaling uh, uh, the usage of startups. I mean, how many are we talking about? How many are you looking at and how many are you then finally uh, using in a given period? I think so for, so for us, just a, just a number. I, I think we did some, I think we did some 800, 900 startup searches based out of, out of I think two or 300 requests uh, out of departments, people in the organization. So also, as you can imagine, the searches come from network recommendations, also from ourselves pushing something into the organization. Um, and at the moment we are around pilot number 20 um, and have already some adoptions of solutions into the organization one or two times, I think two or three. So it takes time, but it, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very fruitful approach and we get better every time we do it. And if you have a department that takes on the first step, we see that they're coming back and they are pretty and early on demanding with their innovation challenges uh, for startup solutions. And we have a much better dialogue in the meantime. So it's, a, it's a self-improving uh, approach uh, that we follow on. Yeah. Maybe to add some data from BMW when when, uh, when I started the first uh, venture client unit at BMW, known as the BMW Startup Garage, we knew that BMW has been buying startup solutions for decades. You know, BMW had a Silicon Valley office as early as 96. So in 2015, before we launched uh, the garage, we looked at so how many startups does BMW engage with as a client, you know, adopting their solution. And it was hard for us to find more than 15 startups over the last 15 years. Wow. So that's one startup per year, correct? Yeah. And the other thing we saw is that it took BMW 25 months to go from a first touch point to the first purchase order. So that's 2.1 years. 
and uh, th th that's a long time and it's, it's a long time for startup but it's especially a long time for the corporate because the engineer if he has a problem to solve doesn't want to wait 25 months to get hands on the technology to solve it so with uh, by implementing that standardized process as maria described which is very critical to become a good venture client as opposed to just a venture client um, we reduce that to under six months on average, sometimes even below, uh, below, below two months. So, and the amount of startups that come into BMW per, on a yearly basis increased by over a factor of 10 compared to without having such a standardized uh, process and an organizational capabilities. I mean, looking here at the Q&A link to this, uh, Gregor, uh, any real live examples uh, how startup help a small startup help bmw tremendously oh yeah the small startup called mobile eye that uh, was acquired for 15 billion dollars just about two years ago by intel and they helped bmw when there were just about 10 people in uh, in the year 2000 to implement the first camera vision machine based or machine learning based camera vision system in 2007 so BMW was using machine learning artificial intelligence in its cameras as early as 2007 when nobody knew how to spell artificial intelligence, let alone machine learning. And that's because of a collaboration they started with a startup uh, as early as 2000 that then became huge. Um, 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 from the 10 people, they, you know, they reached the size I just explained. And they're now the world market leader in, autom in, autonomous, uh, in, in autonomous driving technology. So that's one example of a startup that made a huge impact, uh, that made, it made a huge impact on BMW. Yeah, yeah and we're already in the middle of uh, block three, um, if you will. What do we learn for the future? How can we better collaborate? How can we scale it uh, quicker? And um, here uh, we, have a, we have a question about the right timing. Right, problem with most corporates is uh, that they want to work with startups when they are not startups anymore. Uh, and they might miss innovation. I mean, Christian, maybe, maybe your perspective here as a startup, I mean, how, how do you bring yourself in, in a position that uh, corporates look at you as a potential supplier uh, early in the process? Mm. Yeah, um, uh, pretty easy advice. I, I can speak for the B2B environment, but uh, this is mainly where the whole discussion is about. And it's very content and trust uh, driven uh, the whole environment so what we do and we did very early we uh, uh, took part in discussion roundtables uh, these days we could do this also physically in industry uh, thought leader uh, events and then we explained directly and very precisely and focused which pain point we can solve I think those are the two main things. So you need to be super clear in the pain point you can solve. You always need to reflect, okay, who is the person on the other side, my target buying persona? How can I make him an internal hero? The best would be you can give him the one pager he needs for the budgeting round already with the ROI business case. And that's better than anything else. And then address this to him. I think that's, that's B2B uh, where I really can say that's, that was our success case. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I may be linked uh, to this point and uh, questions again I'm seeing. Uh, Mario, um, I mean, that also means that you as a person running the startup kitchen, you really have to have a very good understanding and knowledge of all the business units, right? Uh, otherwise, you don't know what the, what the problems are your teams are facing. Exactly, exactly. So actually, we have a, a mixed team, a team that uh, there are some on the team who are very, very good in, in evaluating startups in finding the right startups having expertise out of that world able to uh, to assess startups and we have others who have who pretty well know bsh and also all the innovation challenges within bsh and who to talk to who's able to run a project and i think this makes it up uh, you need to have some kind of uh, two-sided knowledge to really make it happen and this is the value of having an own team uh, bringing startups and corporate together. Um, uh, and this is, as I framed it a couple of times, and this is our BSH Startup Kitchen team. Yeah, and uh, now again, uh, linked uh, to questions we are getting here um, about cultures, processes, right? Does this approach 
help here because uh, as we know, startups and corporates run on completely opposite cultures, right? Being 24 seven motivated, solution driven while at a corporate nine to five trooper life. Uh, so how do, you, how do you bring these cultures uh, together? How do you make sure it works out? Maybe, maybe Gregor here. Well, what you do is you focus on the professionalism on both sides and you, and, and, and you focus in your, in your assessment process on the professionalism, both of how you interact as a corporate with a startup and you also look at the professionalism of the startup. And I think professionalism is a, is, is a, is a common denominator, it's a common language. And I can tell you that, you know, Microsoft has a very different culture from BMW but nevertheless, you know, BMW spends, you know, many hundreds of millions on, on Microsoft and the way to communicate and the way to interact and to make sense is just, just to be professional. Because if you think that you have to change your culture before you want to interact with a startup, you will not interact with a startup because the culture is not something you can change with a McKinsey project. Yeah, and maybe looking at the time, uh, this is uh, maybe a good last question here we, we're getting from uh, uh, the audience. I mean, what insight and advice would the, all of you, um, would you give uh, to corporates who are attempting to work closely uh, with startups uh, to create opportunities? I mean, how do you crack often also this internal resistance? Maybe Mario, if you want to go first. Absolutely. So people start hearing you when you bring in competence. So I, I would suggest or I would advise for a skilled team also can be supported by externals because especially for this, uh, this kind of startup uh, research expertise uh, uh, and, and having that and being in the market, you might need some external support and a structured process that everybody can follow on that gives also clarity where you stand. So these two things, I think tear down the walls, can tear down the walls. No. Christian, anything to add from your side? Yeah, I mean, can, can just underline that and to just add, manage the expectations clear and get top management support. So not uh, so no one can do magic. Yeah. Uh, so a chief digital officer cannot uh, make everything digital internally, externally and build the next uh, funders fund, let's say. Really ma manage the expectations, communicate them clear and then uh, yeah, use the drive to move forward. Yeah. yeah. Last but not least, Gregor, final comments. Yeah, what we saw very, very critical, and that goes a long way, is to just change your mindset towards startups. Focus on the why. Focus, and, and the why is I need help from startups. And I need help from startups because they are better than what I can do myself and that what I can do through my current partners. And if you focus on getting help from startup as opposed to I can help startups that will change the whole landscape. You will automatically, you know, focus on those things that are extremely important for you to solve and you will, uh, and you will be able to, uh, to identify, uh, to identify the best startups and to, and to achieve an option. So that mindset of, Hey, I need help from them as opposed to they need my help. That's, that would be my basic recommendation towards, you know, mindset, um, how you think about startup and why you need them. Great, yeah, thanks for sharing your perspective uh, today, Gregor, Mario, and Christian. Uh, looking at uh, some of the comments here, I'm sure the audience has really benefited from your uh, perspectives on how corporates could uh, uh, engage with startups uh, in, a, in a different way. And uh, yeah, for the audience, uh, feel free to stay connected uh, using our INSEAD Lifelong Learning website or our uh, INSEAD, uh, Digital at INSEAD, EDU, where you can also uh, find uh, information about uh, the upcoming uh, webinars um, that we will be holding in the next uh, couple of weeks. So thanks again for the INSEAD, to the INSEAD team for organizing uh, this webinar. And thanks again uh, for joining us. Everybody, uh, please stay safe. Uh, goodbye.